I see no hands. Did any of you do any research about this case? I see no hands. Did anyone attempt to speak to you about this case? I see no hands. Did any of you speak to anyone about this case other than court staff? I see no hands. All right, Dr. Fonseca, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Norman, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. And if I may approach the witness, Your Honor. May. Doctor, I want to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 741. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's several pages, so I just want to take a sure, look. Let me say that I didn't go through it line by line, but I'm familiar with the email, and it is an email that was an IM message from Mr. Alexander to Ms. Arias dated May the 26th, 2008. I'm sorry. It's a chat. What it says is GM mail chat with Travis Alexander, one message. May the 26th, 2008. It states at 447 a.m. And before we broke on Monday, we saw a conversation that Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander were having on May the 26th. Is this a similar type of format to that? Yes. And is this something you read and considered in formulating your opinions about this case? Yes. Your Honor, does the defense remove the hand in Exhibit 741? I don't have any objection. 741 is admitted. And, Doctor, to refresh everyone's memory, did this period of time, May 26th, 2008, Ms. Arias was living where? Ms. Arias was living in California, in Eureka, California. No, it's Wairika, California? Wairika. Wairika. Yes. I want to show you some of the content of 741 and talk about the significance it may or may not have to you, okay? Yes. Drawing your attention to about 2.30 in the morning, Mr. Alexander. 2.36 in the morning? Yes, Doctor, thank you. 2.36 in the morning, where Mr. Alexander advises Ms. Arias that her little comment to Danny Jones makes you look like a cheap whore. See that there? Starting with the words Travis? Travis. Yes, I got a little lost. You said 2.30, then I said 2.36, and that, oh, I see further down. Yes, yes, I see it. I'm sorry. And if you could read her response for us, Doctor. At 2.38 a.m., correct? Her response. Her response, right afterwards. Okay. Only you would say that. Anyone else would see it for what it is. 
an, an anchorman joke. I was just giving him a hard time for showing off and being such a ham. You and I had a conversation about his Facebook pics and their content. I was just razzing him. Could you keep going and see okay. Mr. Alexander's response? Mr. Alexander responds, no, you were flirting with him and you know better than, than and you know better, it's Fanny Jones. Maybe you are just one onto the next dick. And he is an easy target. And doctor, in terms of your diagnosis of the relationship, what, if anything, do you make of this exchange between Harris and Mr. Alexander at this stage of their relationship? OK, I just wanted to rein in again. I'm not here to diagnose, to treat, or to recommend, or to test. I'm here only as a consultant to provide uh, information in terms of my expert opinion with regard to the dynamics of this relationship. So, given that, given that uh, word of caution, I guess. Yes. In terms of providing your expert opinion uh, of this relationship, what then do you make of this exchange between Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander at this point in time in their relationship? Well, in this point in time, when I compare this to other interactions or communicate between the four. This seems like it has more acceleration to it. It, it uh, gives me the impression that it has more umph to it. Um, as I go through the email, it, it begins to show that more aggressive, more abusive, more um, language that is uh, really distasteful, insulting, debasing, devaluing. Objection. Um, uh, foundation. Sustained. Well, what do you mean, accelerating, um, what do you mean by that? I mean, we've talked about this boulder rolling down the hill. Are we talking about this a sign of picking up speed, or is that what you mean? Well, yes. As I said the other day, it's a parallel process where there's, there's a momentum now. And um, this email, uh, this communication on the 26th, it is extensive. It goes on for about 10 to 16 pages. And, it's, and the, the language is, is aggressive. It's, it's much more, the tone, the texture is much more aggressive than what we have seen in prior communications that Mr. Alexander has had with Ms. Arias. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of that steam, that, I mean, they're, they're, he's really going now. And she is uh, really trying to placate, uh, not very different than what her pattern has been in the past in terms of just taking it and trying to really find some peace that she can be uh, acceptable for, for Mr. Alexander. And, and we, we can see this in the email as it unfolds. Looking at uh, 239, when he, uh, this area says, his temperature is cold when it comes to that, referring to Danny Jones. And Mr. Alexander responds, so you have checked it then, what a freaking whore. Um, not going any, any farther, I realize there's a little bit more response, but what does this say about the dynamics when Mr. Alexander feels like he can still control who she's talking to and interacting with? Objection. Lack of foundation as to control. Oh, what? Uh, what? What I see here is um, he brings it back to sex. She's talking about something that is not sexually related. He brings it back to sex. Um, you checked, you checked uh, when he says, so you have checked it then, uh, what a freaking whore, when he's talking about his temperature. Um, it's just more of the same that he brings it back to sex. He doesn't really see her outside of the bedroom, of which she wants to be seen. Not only that we're interacting in the bedroom, but we have something going on outside of the bedroom, and he brings it back to that. And I think that's, and I believe my opinion is, sorry, my opinion is when she's up prior to the message when she says only you uh, would, have, would have come up with that in terms of calling her a whore. In turn, we, we spoke a, a few minutes ago about how uh, Ms. Arias lived in Wairica, California, and Mr. Alexander was still in Mesa. Were they, in, in terms of their relationship, with the label of these ladies, were they together? Were they boyfriend and girlfriend at the time this exchange was happening? Do you understand? That is not a term that uh, Mr. Alexander used in describing his relationship with Ms. Uh, Arias. If you remember, I've said all along that this relationship for Mr. Alexander Fiction had not responsive. The same. Could you explain further, Doctor? 
as I've said before, the relationship that Mr. Arias, that, that Ms. Arias had with Mr. Alexander was she was closeted and hidden away from public view. And, um, you know, I got lost to the question. I'm sorry, Mr. Nermy, forgive me. You'll have to ask well, the question again. My question was, to your understanding, were they uh, in a, there was a period of time when Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias functioned under the, they labeled their relationship boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, was that, was May 2008, to your understanding, a period of time when they, they used that label? No. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at uh, 242, you see here with uh, uh, the bottom of 243. Yes, okay. Like I said, I've never dealt with a more solid mm. form of evil. Yes. And uh, it begins the question, you know, if Mr. Alexander really believes this, why in terms of the dynamics of this relationship is he still interacting with Ms. Arias and, and having sex with her a couple of weeks later? Objection, speculation. Overall. That's been the whole crux of the whole thing, right, is when he clearly states there, uh, I have never dealt with a more solid form of evil. That's his struggle, is that, is that uh, connection that he has with Miss Arias. The more he discovers he's pleased, uh, pleased by the sexual interaction that he has with her, the more he explores that, the more satisfactory he becomes, the angrier he can become. She becomes the target. She's the evil. Remember that in the tape, where it is um, recorded that he's having a sexual interaction with Miss Arias. When he is in high sexual arousal, it comes through and he's asking, is this, is it wrong? Do you feel guilty? So when he points and he says, like I said, I've never dealt with a more solid form of evil, to be sexual, to be uh, sexual out of marriage. Uh, in, Objection, in speculation. Mm -hmm. Christine. Let's, let's carry on. So he, um, he also says that uh, he accuses her of blatantly lying. Yes. Again, again, I mean, what do we make of this? If he means this and he thinks she's so awful and evil, why the continued interaction? It's the same answer. He is erotically tied to her, sexually tied to her. It's, he doesn't like it. He really, he really perceives it as a form of evil. He wants to just disassociate from it. That's why it's closeted. That's why it's quiet. Um, and when he's talking about um, blatantly lying, um, as I've said before, it is true that Ms. Arias has changed her story. But comparatively speaking, uh, the person who has misrepresented themselves to the public at large, to his family, to his friends, is Mr. Alexander. Miss Arias uh, doesn't have this kind of protracted history. And I think that Mr. Mr. Travis, when he is saying uh, the solid form of evil, is I think it's perhaps the first time that he actually labels Objection, what he's going to get this. Uh, overall. I think, uh, as I said, when he is saying, uh, I've never dealt with a more solid form of evil, uh, my opinion is that, in fact, that's what it is for him, is that sexual struggle that he's having. Sexual speculation. Overall. That sexual struggle that he is having, that he has attempted to, to really catch, to, to do away with. Um, but it's so pleasurable for him. You can hear it in the sex tape where he wants to make a legitimate pornographic movie. He calls Miss Arias a porn star. Miss uh, Arias is perceived by Mr. Alexander as being just that, a porn star, someone who is going to satisfy his 
uh, sexual desires. Uh, a porn star is not a star in the Mormon community as he perceives it. So this is, I think, one of the reasons why he's just really more closeting her, separating that out that builds much more tension within him, and she becomes the target of that. Because she's satisfying him. It's difficult for him to really deal with that outside of the bedroom. Let me go to the next page of this. Yeah, doctor. Drawing your attention to just before 2.45, if, if you could read that for us, please. Just before, Travis, I do realize that I hate you so much. You have been more cause of pain than the death of my father. You are relentless in your torture of people that have loved you and protected you and served you. And what do you do? You try to destroy them. You are the lowest of the low. You are sick and evil. And knowing you makes me want to kill myself in punishment. I'm so stupid. I don't even, I don't even know if you are human. Viserius responds. Well, hang, hang okay. Before, before you go on there, based yep. on what you said before, if he gets the question, although he's speaking in this area, is Mr. Alexander really speaking about himself, how he feels about himself? Objection, speculation. Sustained. Sir, <clears throat> Rephrase. In your expert opinion, is Mr. Alexander really speaking about himself as opposed to what he thinks in this area? Objection, speculation. Overall. Judge, may we approach? You may. The question before you dealt with the idea of whether the feelings Mr. Alexander is expressing uh, in this rant, if you will, was of the nature that he's talking about himself, based on your expert opinion, or really talking about feelings about Ms. Harris. You sort of tuned out. I can't, uh, okay. you're not speaking up, sorry. Do you recall the question I asked before the objection? I believe the question that you asked was, uh, what was not Mr. Uh, Alexander, in fact, making reference, talking about himself? Right. Ultimately. And, and you started to tell us that, yes, you believe that, and I'd like you to explain that, your reasons for that to the jury. It's my opinion that he's really describing a process that he has, that, um, that this crisis that he has been having all along that I don't think people have been aware of when he's talking about um, relentless in your torture of people that have loved you and protected you and served you. Um, Mr. Alexander is, was a likable fellow. He was affable. He was engaging. The ladies liked him. He has loyal friends to this day. Um, but recall the uh, email of Miss Andrews, that there was a piece of him not so nice. Recall the emails of the Hughes, uh, particularly Miss Sky Hughes, who talked about that he's mean, that he's abusive. Um, and these are people that accepted him. Uh, the Hugheses who, who talk about, we know you, we, we, they know this about him. They describe it the rough around the edges. It's a concern for Mr. Alexander, uh, in my opinion, in terms of this struggle of going back and forth. Uh, when he talks about um, you're the solid form of evilness in reference to Miss Arias, I, uh, my opinion is that she is the target of his anger because she pleases him so much sexually, which he knows is a no-no in his community as a priesthood holder, as, as a fellow that is not to be participating in sexual activities prior to marriage or after marriage with other people. Um, and I think this is what his struggle is, and he's projecting this onto uh, Miss Aries. 
that's my opinion, is that he's in conflict and he's just projecting it onto him. Mr. Alexander has not, in all the things that I have reviewed, has not openly stated and described this struggle for himself. He's not owned that for himself openly. But if we turn down the volume and look at the behavior, just the behavior, we see there is a struggle here. This contact with Ms. Arias. Ms. Arias is out of California when this, this is sent. Ms. E is planning on visiting her at the end of the month. He's planning on going up there. They've been having contact on the phone, uh, text messaging during the, the time that she has left California into Arizona. They're still having this erotic sexual interaction over the phone. Doctor, what, if anything, is to be made of uh, Ms. Arias' reaction where she says, I'm so sorry, uh, if any, you, arrive, you are lied into this world, I can't even compare? Yes. This is similar to what we have seen throughout, uh, very early in the emails that Sky Hughes has written indicating that Ms. Arias is making excuses for Mr. Alexander in terms of his behaviors and his, his quote unquote bad behavior. That's my word, that's not Ms. Hughes's uh, term. Um, and Ms. Hughes brings it back to she's making excuses for you. It's abusive behavior. This is in the email in January of 07. I think this is the same thing that you're seeing here. I am so, so sorry. Blaming herself again, making excuses. Not Mr. Alexander, but Ms. Arias. This is a pattern that we have seen starting back in January of 07 when it's articulated by Ms. Hughes, that she's making excuses for Mr. Alexander. He goes on, we can see he compares her to Hitler, uh, those sort of things. Uh, it is, it, well, we talked about this a little bit uh, on Monday, I think. Is love the reason that she's not just, just continuing this conversation? She says, you know what, I've had enough, I'm out of this? The leading speculation. Overall, can you answer yes or no? Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, it's not a yes or no answer, I'm sorry. Well, then rephrase your question. So, let me ask you this, to start with the yes or no, and then we can offer explanation. But is it love is the reason that Ms. Arias is saying, you know what, see you later? Yes. And why at this point in time, based on your opinion, uh, is that love Ms. Arias has for him still powerful enough to preclude her from doing that? Well, it's that erotic connection, it's that sexual connection, and it's also an unrequited love. Um, it's not reciprocated completely. Um, there are people that, say, that, have, that are in relationships and experience unrequited love, but this is different. This is not like any other relationship. This is a closeted relationship. This is a closeted relationship that is filled with a lot of sexual satisfaction. This is a closeted relationship that uh, Mr. Alexander spends a lot of energy in keeping closet, keeping quiet. Um, Ms. Arias uh, stretches and stretches and tr tries to do whatever she can to get some recognition. Uh, the, the ed he wrote a book in 2008 and she edited it. She wanted some recognition. This is similar to when after, shortly after she met uh, in 2007 at the Hughes and he walks in and doesn't even acknowledge her. Remember Ms. Sky Hughes talked about that in an email, that she would like to be recognized. He wrote a book in 2000, uh, late 2007, 2008, and she was editing it. Finally put it together and there's not one sentence, not one word, one paragraph, no mention of her having any kind of input into that. Uh, she was wanting some public acknowledgement that she existed. He snuffed her out, her identity her existence, who she was. It's almost as though she was invisible, not here. This is the reason why uh, the friends, Mr. Hyatt, uh, Mr. Morrison, were, were surprised uh, that she still had a relationship or connection with him. They were quoted as saying, I think Mr. Hyatt said, absolutely not. Impossible, said Mr. Uh, Taylor Searle, that he had a double life. 
But when we stand back and we open up the lens, we see that, in fact, there's something else that has been going on here, that he has been a master to be able to, to cover it up, to deceive people, not to have people know this is an active, alive thing that's going on in his life, which is this sexual interaction that he has had with Miss Arias, which, by the way, has been for almost two years now, because it started in 2006, and it goes all the way up until February of 2008. And that has been ongoing for that period of time that he has had that closet. It takes a lot of energy to keep that down there. And the impact of that, psychologically, that, all, that also has an impact of being depressed, feeling devalued. And this is what's taking momentum. This is what's now catching up steam. And it culminates in 2008. Doctor, I want to move a little forward uh, in the email. Uh, Ms. Arias is starting to talk about uh, how she's a bartender in a Mexican restaurant. Um, Can you tell me where you are, please? Uh, okay, at the top. I'm sorry. She talks about being a bartender. Um, there. And uh, Travis calls it a sludge job. Maybe you can get tips for BJ's. Oh, I'm sure you can. You're good at that. Um, first of all, in terms of your, uh, it may be obvious to, to a lot of people, but in terms of your uh, studies in the sexual realm, what is BJ's slang for? Blow jobs. Oral copulation. So what do we make of this uh, dialogue of Mr. Alexander's telling her uh, that, you know, she should, she's, she's a slut for being a bartender and she could uh, perform oral sex on them for money? Well, it's how he sees her, right? He, thought, he calls her uh, a whore. He calls her a porn star. He doesn't see much of other attributes in this area. It's primarily focused on sex. He brings it back to sex. In the beginning of the email, brings it back to sex. You're probably going to jump on somebody's, another man's dick. Um, you're good at DJs, blowjobs. He brings it back to that, not to other uh, virtues of her character, of her personality. It's just focused on vagina and anus. And what do you make of her response where she begins by saying, yeah, according to... What yeah, according to what you've said, I've had that car paid off in one shift with vacation money to spare. Um, maybe I could use you as a reference. My impression is she's getting into the banter with him and being sarcastic with him um, is, what I, is how I interpret that. He calls her... Uh, Three-hole wonder you are good for something. First of all, what is a, based on your training and experience, what is the term three-hole wonder in reference to? Objection, lack of speculation as to the term. Training, 701, 702. Approach, please. Doctor, just to begin with, um, are you familiar, based on your training experience, with the term uh, three-hole wonder? Yes. And what is that a reference to? Objection to foundation, how she is familiar with that. Sustained. Doctor, you've been working with sexual deviance for over 30 years, is that correct? I have. And uh, you, in your uh, work, you would interview these people, uh, make assessments of them. Is that accurate? Yes. And in terms of uh, keeping up on the literature and the sexual practices of these sexual deviants, um, do you stay abreast of terms they might use for uh, certain behaviors or certain interests? I attempt to. And based on all this uh, review, is that why you understand what the term three whole wonder means? Yes. And, they, and if you could explain to the jury what that term is a reference to. Yeah. 
the reference is three hole wonder is a reference to orifice, mouth, anus, and vagina. Now, having said that, um, question beyond the scope of the question, she's answered it. Sustained. Is there further explanation? Yes. And what would that be? Well, that would be in terms of uh, you're asking me if I'm keeping abreast to the ter terms and so forth and so on. Sexuality, an unconventional sexuality, is uh, uses terms, has a culture that is not always so openly to the general public at large. So there are terms, um, paraphernalia that is uh, utilized and developed uh, in these underworld worlds, for example, that can exist right here in front of you and that you don't see it because you're not, you're not, you don't have that sexual proclivity, if you will. So it's, you will, f one finds at different times the peculiar use of words in unconventional sexual material. So three-hole wonder in this case Mr. Alexander is making reference to how he has utilized Ms. Arias's body, her mouth, her anus, and her vagina. So for him, it's a three-hole wonder, which I think also uh, reflects what he has enjoyed about Ms. Ms. Arias. That should be on the scope of the question. Uh, speculation. Sustained. Well, is it, is it an expression of the, to, to re, uh, recharacterize what you're saying then, um, Dr. Fonseca, are we saying that Miss Arias's body, those orifices, that's all that he cared about at this point in time? Yes. And is there also, do you believe, a derogatory connotation to, to telling her that? Yes. It's dehumanizing, it's debasing. And we talked about Miss Arias suffering in silence. When she reacts and doesn't end the relationship, is she suffering in silence? She is. Mr. Alexander goes on to accuse her of lying and stealing journals and slashing tires, uh, more lying. But, but, but based on what you're telling us, he's still involved in this thing, in these things, whether he believes them or not, because he still wants those access to those orifices. Intense and leading. Oh, well. I'm sorry, could you repeat your answer? Intensely. He's, he's, uh, he hasn't let go of her. She's moved out of state. He's still contacting her. He had plans to go and visit her that weekend, to go up and spend a weekend with her. Uh, I don't believe the people were aware of this continual contact that he's had for a year and a half of having an ongoing sexual relationship with her. He goes on continuing more about the tires and the, and the, uh, and the crew and he says your life is worthless. Um, I want to draw your attention to Ms. Arias' response to this tirade. It keeps going on and on. And looking at just past 314 in the morning, um, did you read Ms. Arias' response? I may be a liar, I may be a whore, I may be evil, I may be a coward. I am not be worth the air that I breathe. I am most like the most horrible person you've ever had the misfortune of knowing. But the one thing I am not is violent. I think I did not and would not and would have never slashed your tires. What do, what do we make of, and I, and I don't, obviously we can agree, Doctor, I think that Ms. Arias was violent on June 4th. No question about it, Mr. Nurmi. But putting that aside for the moment, what do, we, what do you make of Ms. Arias' response after all this berating, this belittling her down to being three orifices to him, and she says, you know, I, I may be these things. I may be a liar. I may be a whore. She's starting to absorb this. What do you make of this? 
she is starting to absorb this, but she draws a line and she makes it emphatic in capital N-O-T. I am not violent in reference to the slashing of the tires. What do you make, though, of her internalization, or what seems to be like an internalization of his label of her? Well, that she's incorporated that. She is um, almost believing that, if you will. I am worthless. I may be a coward. I may be a whore. I may be evil. Again, it's, this is the impact, the ramifications of the psychological impact of this, this ongoing relationship for a period of time. This Arius doesn't come to the table psychologically equipped to understand or to deal or manage with Mr. Alexander. Remember, they both came out of abusive homes. She came out of a home where the father was berating the mother and her, and physically pushing, shoving, slapping her. Um, so she's not well equipped to deal with a fellow like Mr. Alexander. What do you mean, a fellow like Mr. Alexander? <laughs> Well, Mr. Alexander was described by his friends as a, as a gentleman that commanded um, attention. He was high energy. Uh, when I looked at the videos uh, of him uh, speaking, uh, one gets an intensity about this man. Uh, he walks in the room and you know he's there. He has a presence. Um, it's probably difficult for, for people to navigate him and to manage him. And if you come to the table where you've got some, some, uh, some vulnerability psychologically or you're not well equipped, um, it's easy to get bowled over. Some of the women that Mr. Alexander was in contact with was able to put those parameters, probably because they had more uh, psychological strengths and um, wherewithal than uh, Miss Arius at the time. Remember Miss Lisa Andrews? Uh, even though I think Mr. Alexander was infectious, people wanted to be around him. He inspired people. That, that was a common thing that people said about Mr. Alexander, that he is inspiring. Um, his siblings talk about that, about how inspiring he was. Um, and it's a lot of energy. And uh, when he came into contact with some women who had the wherewithal to sort of navigate him, Miss Avila in a text message, who, from what I could tell from the message, was a Mormon, and he was asking, what can we do? How far can we go? Right away, she puts up a stop sign and says, uh, we can talk to the bishop. He doesn't want to do that. Uh, Miss uh, Andrews, who also sets up parameters, uh, doesn't, doesn't respond like Miss Arias does, where he can just mold her. Recall that Miss Andrews said how Mr. Alexander wanted to mold her. Uh, text messages that he sends to Miss Reagan. I don't know if you have an opportunity to see those, but that is also another woman who puts parameters around him. Miss Arias simply didn't do that. Drawing your attention, Doctor, to the next page, 319, Travis says, you never saw me, uh, you never saw me of more value as a piece of shit unless I was serving some purpose to you. I'm less than nothing to you. Miss Arias responds by saying she loved Mr. Alexander, um, but her letter gets so distorted. Yes. What do you make of this exchange, Miss Arias, at this point in time, uh, my impression is that um, she's telling him, I really did love you, but I let it get so distorted she has commented that in different journal articles about how, in different journal entries, about how this, um, she was blindsided. She didn't see it coming. She felt that there was a cancer, a negativity that spread within her. Um, she, in a conversation that she's having with uh, Mr. Alexander, um, I don't remember, it was an email or text messages talking about it. We, we stretched it too far. And I believe that's what she's talking about here but I let it get so distorted. I want to draw your attention to uh, part of this Arius' response here. It begins with me at 321. But if you could be so kind as to read the portion that begins at 322, you deserve. And this is a response from? Miss Arias, you deserve so much more than the crap I've given you. You deserve a wealth that is beyond this world. I deserved a pile of shit for what I have done to my friend. 
is is there any evidence? I mean, obviously, we said Miss Arias wasn't perfect in this relationship, and I guess to some degree she's acknowledging that. And would you agree? I think what she's done here is bought. My opinion is what she's done here is that she's bought the negativity. She's not worth much. She's worthless. She's incorporated that now because she says, um, I deserve a pile of shit for what I've done to my friend. And she's still speaking to him endearingly, even though he's very angry in this email. He's just blasting her and he's still, you know, I've, I've done what I've done to my friend. Three twenty four. Uh, he he blames her for trying to. Uh, you tried to murder me from the inside out. How could you? You see that? There? Oh, Travis, I gave you anything I could. I sacrificed everything I could, and you just tried to murder me from the inside out. How could you? Obviously, we know about the sad events of June 4, 2008. But is there anything at this point in time, anything that you reviewed that would warrant that there's any validity to this idea that Ms. Arias was trying to sabotage Mr. Alexander's life? No. What I, what I see there is, again, what I said the last time I was sitting here talking to you, which is the theme of death. It's always back here in the background. And I can trace, when I go back to the record, I can trace this uh, back to late 2007, um, where she, there is a continual, uh, particularly after the, the discovery of the infidelities, of being depressed, of being suicidal. And Mr. Alexander, in this month of May 2008, Mr. Alexander makes reference of killing himself. He writes to Mr. Hughes and says, um, Miss Mimi Hall has, I'm paraphrasing, has, has basically rejected having a romantic relationship with him. And he writes and says, I have effed my, my life up. I want to kill myself. Um, in an email that he's writing to Miss uh, Reagan, in the same month, just days before, he's talking about taking a gun or that he's learned how to make a noose i.e. as in a rope to hang himself. So death has been there. The paragraph that he writes at the beginning of uh, a gold digger, he's talking about death there as well. So death has been in the background, in my assessment, throughout the time that this man has been involved with this woman. At 320, 333, excuse me, uh, Mr. Alexander makes a comment to Ms. Arias, blames her for manipulating him into loving her. Uh, and he says he was a good guy. Why did you have to do it to me? What do you make of those comments? I think my, what I, what I, my impression from these comments is that he is really capturing, um, I was a good guy. I mean, this is who he wanted to be. He was a committed Mormon. He was a priest holder in the Mormon church. He was there on Sunday mornings. This is who he really wanted to be, who he wanted to project to be. Miss Arius, for whatever reason, got the pin number to his sexuality. And he was much more seasoned than her in terms of how he was seeking other individuals to engage in sexually. Was Miss Arias knowledgeable about sexuality? Of course. She had been living with a man for four years. Prior to that, she lived with another man for two years. Prior to that, she had other sexual encounters, but not to the degree of Mr. Alexander. And I think he is up upset. I was a good guy. I was a good guy. This is who he wanted to be. This is who he projected. He had people actually believing that. This is why people were shocked to discover this other side. And trust me, it's been difficult to testify about this other side with the family. Of relevance. Yes. After uh, he talks about uh, how, uh, you know, blaming Miss Arias uh, for manipulating, could you begin her response there at 334 reading that? It begins with me. 
There have been times when you have screamed into the phone so loud at me that the speaker was distorted and then you hung up. The pain was so sharp and so deep that I just couldn't process it. I could only scream in response to the air and I would scream at the top of my lungs until my throat was raw. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, until I had no energy left to say it and had, it, it had wilted down to a little wimp. I hate you. I just sobbed and cried until I couldn't breathe. But you know what? I deserved all of that. Every angry phone call, every unpleasant word doesn't compare to what I've put you through. It doesn't begin to measure up. I've done you more wrong, and that is apparent, without even keeping score. Let me go down because there's more talk from Mr. Alexander about uh, her ruining him and that sort of thing. But I want to get down again to the uh, portion beginning with me and more of what Ms. Arias has to say about me. I don't, I don't know what you mean by ruin you. I would never deliberately set out to do that. I was bitter, yes. I tried to be a big girl in other ways by lending you my few hundred dollars when you were refi dependent on it, by giving you membership that would have taken me out of chargebacks, uh, by devoting time to pushing through those last few counters at the last hours of the month you, so you could would qualify. It was an endless struggle. I was resentful for other things, but I've always wanted you to succeed. I haven't deliberately set out to try and ruin you. I am so sorry for what I have done. Keep going, Doctor. Those nice things listed above don't even begin to add up to the counterbalance, the horrible things I've done. It, it should have all been different. It's my fault. I'm 100% responsible for this. You did those things. I'm sorry. This this is, what, do we, what do we make of this dialogue from Ms. Arias? Ms. Arias, again, is, you know, it's all my fault. It, I was bad, you know, but I did these things. I wanted you to succeed. I wanted to give to you. Moving down, Mr. Alexander makes the comment about 344. I think I was a. Uh, a little more than a dildo with a heartbeat uh, to you, dear Kish. Is there any evidence to suggest that, that that is true? Or is that just how Mr. Alexander saw it? Because he blamed Ms. Harris for her sexuality. His sexuality. Objection, speculation. Sustained. How do you view this comment by Mr. Alexander? It is once again bringing it back to sex. He's not hearing her. It brings it back to sex, back to genital area. I was, uh, I'm losing it. Where is it here on the? Towards the, towards the, the yes. Uh, I think I was a little more than a dildo with a heartbeat to you. It brings it back to the sexuality. And she responds on the next line. Well, she responds by saying, I would have been content just cuddling, but I wasn't strong enough. What I interpret that to mean is she acknowledges that she didn't have that psychological wherewithal. She wasn't strong enough. There were psychological vulnerabilities there, some impairment there. Is there anything on this record to suggest that uh, Ms. Arias was somehow using Mr. Alexander for sex? The entire year and a half documentation, what I had reviewed, did not appeared to reveal that. It was the other way around. Moving on to page seven of this dialogue. <clears throat> he talks about more and more lies, how she's not sorry, he accuses her more and more. Let's go down to th uh, 3.49 a.m., Ms. Arias' response. If you were here, I don't know, but you're not here and I'm not there, and we're behaving ourselves. I get so caught up in wanting to do the right thing, and then when you come around, I want to do a different version of the quote-unquote right thing. 
and it may be a two-way street, but I never mind. We shouldn't even be discussing this. I don't know what else to say. Is, is that, what is that, uh, what, what, what value do you place on that? I see where she says, uh, and then you come around and I want to do a different version of the quote unquote right thing. I interpret that the same what I've said before. Mr. Alexander uh, was infectious, was, uh, was bigger than life figure for her and to many people. And um, he had a way of just changing it. Uh, for example, uh, when she converted into Mormonism. Um, he was giving a variety of different explanations of the kinds of sex that was going to be quote unquote okay to do, uh, knowing full well that any sexual activity was prohibited. Let's take a look at this uh, sentence that begins here between 359 and ends down at uh, 402 uh, sentence, but, but the entire uh, paragraph, if you will. The line that starts with me. Uh, yes. Under 359, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Everything I feel moved to say wouldn't hold an ounce of weight with you. But what I was going to say is this. The sexual part of me was an unevolved way of trying to be more loved. I knew you weren't in love with me. I knew you cared. But it wasn't that kind of love. So when we made love, I was able to actually convince myself, yes, lie to myself. It really felt for that space of time that I was something, that it was something bigger and better. But it's the intoxication felt from the, from the sex. And you made it so good. You, came another, you became another person. It's like you nearly worshipped me. I felt so, so, so loved when we did that. It became absolutely addicting. But you weren't just a piece of me. Either way, that, what, that doesn't speak for the way I've treated you outside of your bedroom. Is, is this to you an indication that Jody loved Travis and Travis loved having sex with Jody Harris? Yes. Could you explain why? Well, when she says, uh, I knew you cared, but that was, it wasn't that kind of love. So when we made love, I was able to actually convince myself, yes, lie to myself. It really felt that for a space and time. But that was the intoxication felt from the sex, and you made it so good. She acknowledges the sexuality and the sexual connection that they both had. But if you notice in the emails above when she said, I'd be satisfied with just cuddling. That's the non-sexual, that's, that's the intimate aspect. It's not necessarily sexual. It's the emotional aspect of a relationship. This is not what he was wanting, really, to interact with, with regard to intimacy. Recall that in the sex tape, uh, when he's talking about, uh, quote unquote, pounding her booty for three hours straight, that doesn't sound like tender lovemaking to me. Um, Objection. Relevance as to her standard. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the morning recess. Ten minutes, ten minutes. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. All right. How are you doing going too fast, too slow? How are you doing?